Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Brent Ford, and I'm the AME teacher at El Cajon Valley High School. And we're doing a guest speaker virtual uh, session here with my good friend and compadre, John Roy from John Roy Sound here locally in San Diego. John, welcome to El Cajon Valley High School. Woo! That's a smattering of applause. Quite the smattering. <laughs> John, you've been here before and, and yeah, talked to the students. Whites for that smattering, got to clean it up. <laughs> I think they're all sold out at Walmart. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Make your own. Make your own. Hey, you've been here before to El Cajon Valley High School uh, numerous times, and, um, and you've been a great resource for the students here uh, to learn from about uh, running your own business, but also kind of um, touching on topics of, of careers in the AME industry. So welcome back. And now I'm gonna have some voice over the PA talking. <laughs> I love it. Evacuation instruction. Right, hopefully it's not, yeah, a lockdown drill or something, fire drill or something like that. <laughs> Power will be turned off in exactly two seconds. So, God, that, please don't let that happen again. Hey, um, so what are you doing with the COVID stuff? I mean, what I know you, it, everything's kind of on shutdown, and that's a big industry. What tell me? Tell the kids that are watching this what you do for a living, and then, uh, and then we can. What's that? What I did do, or what I'm doing now. Well, yeah, that's kind of what I was was getting to. Like, tell tell us what you what you did do, and then how has it been impacted by what's going on with COVID? All right. Whew, that's a long one. I know. That's yeah. not such a softball. Yeah. All right. You said you'd pitch softballs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, telling what you do is a softball. I don't know about the COVID part, but we'll, we'll we can be short on that. Well, no, the. Uh... I will, I will treat it as though I still did it. So what the business was doing until um, March 13th of 2020. Which was a Friday, by the way. Yeah. Friday the 13th. Yeah. Um, we normally rent out uh, gear, um, sound equipment, DJ equipment, backline equipment, lighting equipment, truss, staging, and I'm sure I'm missing two or three others. Full production. Everything from flip charts, wireless mics to projectors mm -hmm. to moving headlights. So if somebody's putting on a concert, if somebody's putting on a, a theatrical production, if somebody's oh. putting on some sort of seminar, they're calling John Roy Sound. Yep. The only thing that um, we don't rent are large scale generators just because there's in California, um, there's some heavy. EPA regulations and uh, okay. I hire other companies or rent from other companies okay. to cover that. Yeah. But after that, after we get, you know, a 25,000 watt generator, we plug all my distro in, we have everything, cable ramps all the way to a stage. We even have a, you know, small stage or we can set up everything on a trailer stage. And we're, they were, we were self-contained from that point forward. We did stuff like, um, you know, at one point we did Adams Avenue Street Fair, uh, we've done OB Street Fair, we've done uh, OB Oktoberfest, um, PB Fest, so lots of festival type stuff. You do stuff uh, with Comic Con. Yeah, that was that was actually one of our biggest, <laughs> biggest weeks of the year usually. Yeah. Um, I I used to work inside Comic Con for MSI, um, but I realized. <laughs> that uh, I needed to have 17 hours a day free during the week in order to rent stuff to other people that were doing events outside of Comic-Con. Right. Hold on, adjust my mic, sorry. Kind of moved a bit. There. Yeah. Um, so we, we ended up renting stuff and doing multiple events outside of Comic-Con and it was always the biggest week. Um, the joke is if I could sweep the floor, we're doing really good. Because if you, you can see the floor, that means that a lot of gear is gone from the warehouse. And that means we're all making money. Right. And on a week like that, or I, I did the Coronado Parade for 4th of July um, every year for nine years. Uh, 
uh, I did uh, five stages for the Rock and Roll Marathon San Diego too. I mean, show after show after show, weekend after weekend, we would do um, anything from two shows like a Friday and Saturday to five or six shows with multiple trucks and hiring out, you know, up to 12 people over the weekend. That's pretty big time, man. I mean, some, some of the, some of the people that, um, that you employ, I'm sure depend on that paycheck and, 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 you know, they're, they're only working for John Roy sound, right? I mean, you have employees that just work for you and they're not working for other companies, correct? Yeah. What's going on with the R and D in the background? Someone's doing some pop. I, I keep trying to mute it so that, that it won't impede what you're saying, but it's essentially that's our bell song. So like when it's time to go to class, instead of hearing like a bell, they, they put on music and yeah. So that's kind of how that works. Well, okay, so we got another half hour before it happens again. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, it goes off in another half hour. So. <laughs> oh, so sorry, where were we? I was... So I was just saying, you know, you, you probably have a lot of employees that work with you. Um, you know, what's going on with all that stuff right now? Yeah, so um, basically it was uh, four, four full-time employees and then eight uh, part-timers, you know, they'd be basically like a temporary on call. Um, previously they were freelancers, but with, uh, the AB five law passing in January, I turned anybody who was a, a freelance worker, um, into an employee. And then unfortunately had to not call some other freelancers within the, that style of business. And so, uh, that way I, I went to paying like workman's comp insurance for everybody mm -hmm. and getting a payroll system in place and, you know, bi-weekly paychecks and even paid myself a little bit. Hey, that's always nice. Yeah. I, currently. So, so that was what was happening until March of this year. Gotcha. Uh, currently um, I had to lay everybody off. Okay. Um, a couple of people have moved out of state because they had family in other States and they had, you know, people, friends or family with homes they could stay at and uh, could hopefully wait this thing out. Um, a few other people, they went ahead and found other jobs like telecommuting kind of thing, um, like salespeople that are doing what you're doing on a laptop remotely with a different company. Uh, unfortunately, this business uh, of renting gear and doing live productions with people um it's not happening right now right well we we've done a few again like like the zoom meeting you know we've done some facebook live streaming from uh so business has turned into this it's it turned from all that stuff to now i do rentals for djs that are doing like small parties and even that's not happening now mm -hmm. but it was like small parties um they would do outdoors, small weddings, um, okay. baby showers, things like that, yeah. where people would socially distance and just have a couple speakers. So, so versus like um, a whole truck full of gear, it, it started to become, hey, please wear a mask, come into my shop, I'll wear a mask, we'll load you up into your car, and I'll see you on Monday. Right. So going from a $10,000 gig to $250. Wow. That's pretty heavy, um, man. I am, I'm the owner of the company. I'm not an employee. So uh, I didn't get any, uh, no unemployment, no EDD. Um, even the pandemic unemployment insurance has not kicked in due to uh, another clerical error at the EDD. That's a whole other story. But um, I, I do memorize my social security number and have remembered it and memorized it since I was 10 years old. And evidently, the person inputting that data put got it in a, wrong got a digit off oh wow um and uh, no ppp for me and no uh no small business administration loans so I, i'm sure you've applied for all that and it's I just have. not coming in i have and it hasn't yeah that's, that's frustrating to hear yeah i, I think that if uh it, it's interesting i think that the students will probably relate um 
you see when people already have money and they already have connections and they already have a lawyer and they already have their own for personal financial planner, yeah. they have all that stuff put together. They can just get stuff done. And, you know, when it, when you're not, when you're not hurting, if you lose a paycheck, then you're going to still do pretty good. If you have the resources, you'll keep the resources. Right. Versus folks like me didn't have, all those extra resources you know it's kind of a, a one-man band with um three or four you know key people full-time people like a, a family situation you know sure uh, but if you don't have that it's hard to climb up that that hill it's hard yeah. to get all those things accomplished oh. yeah it's like where do you start you know the the uh the paperwork part and the and just the time and and all the stuff that goes into it is so overwhelming it's it's hard yeah. to a lot about filling out forms um i also learned that um if you if you actually had a pi financial planner some of that you pay or a lawyer that you pay on retainer or you have someone a friend or family that has the ability to handle that then try and use it as much as you can right you know yeah um, so pandemic situation if you don't have if you don't have uh the resources already in place yeah how do you plan for that it's kind of crazy yeah for those of us who are always living uh, paycheck to paycheck which is pretty much i don't know the percentages but it feels like about 90 percent of the world yeah i know i'm in that same boat so paycheck, to paycheck. yeah so you have to do what you got to do in order to keep paying your bills correct uh, so here's go, the public, kids. <laughs> so go back before March 13th. What was your favorite type of uh, the 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 job? What was your favorite thing to do uh, on a daily or weekly or monthly basis? Hmm. Well, I just said said yes to most everything. Um, I I mean I know you, John, as an amazing sound man. Like your, your ear is unbelievable. You can tell a frequency and, and, and to add or subtract to that frequency, like nobody I've ever met, but I don't know if that's your favorite part of the job or if you have other things that were more fun to you. Um, no, I'd say my favorite, my favorite part is, is two things actually. One part is to see, to see all the Legos, all the Tinker Toys, all of the, you know, erector set the whole PA taken from a truck and in like three hours it's on a stage making noise yeah. <laughs> and, and it wasn't there. There was no stage there. It was just a street. Right. And within three hours, there's a stage, a sound system, lighting, backline gear, a full PA and you're already running sound through it. And a neighborhood that had the sound of cars or buses and jackhammers it's all of that was replaced. Like for me, I'll, I'll replace it usually with reggae. Right. <laughs> you know, like I'll just jam some, some roots reggae really loud in the neighborhood. And yeah. it makes me feel like, yeah, guys, here you go. There you go. You go. <laughs> but um, it, could have, it could have been rock. It could have been blues. It could have been yeah. anything. Right. Well, for some people, and I I'm included too, is a little ACDC goes a long way. <laughs> yeah. There you go. A little hell's bells was really cool uh, so that was that's one half of it is the going from nothing to setup it's amazing and then at the end of a night you know at 3 a.m the street is sweet swept and everything's gone again yeah it's, it's like you were never there for like whoo right as you're like gnomes man <laughs> little, little elves made things happen made it disappear again um so the second half of that is through all the stuff and all the work and all the just junk you have to deal with, if you get a good hour and a half of an incredible band and you mix them and you get to be part of that concert, in that sense, it's like really fulfilling. It's it's kind of a spiritual thing. You get the, the goosebumps on the back of your neck, the hair standing up. It's a, just nothing like it. And when you're a, a live audio engineer in particular, you for that moment in time, so for like an hour, 
you're a member of that band. You are the live producer of that band and you're a member of that band because you're shaping the stuff they play on stage that goes out to the people. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And I, I truly feel like that too, that the sound men are, are really, um, they're, they're not recognized as-, as... Sound men and sound women, the sound people. Thank you. Thank you, sound people. It's just money at some point here and, uh, and Nix makes us feel good. You know, I'd Absolutely. rather play music when I'm playing music than have to mix myself. So someone like Nix Jesmani, plug, plug for her, get her some more work. <laughs> and we're we're gonna see Nix next week, so that's that's a good segue right there. So, do you have any favorite bands that you've worked with uh, as a as a sound engineer or rented gear to? Anybody that's super cool to work with, or any good stories about any bands? I okay, this is a silly story, but. Um, also Motley, I did backline for them plus in-ears. And the fun part is that their percussionist is really tall. And they said, we need to have a, a, a timbale stand and a percussion stand and a cymbal stand for a guy who's like seven feet tall. Normally stands are, you know, four feet tall. So I had to take cymbal stands and cut them with a chop saw and <laughs> fit them. Fit them. And like Frankenstein the whole thing together, so wow. they have them too in case Oso Motley rents anything from me. Uh huh. But I had it so that you know the guy's percussion stand and timbales were going to be two feet higher than they could normally go. So that's awesome. That, that was fun in, from a rental. Um, from shows, I've I just had so many incredible experiences of that hair on the back back of your neck standing up. Yeah. Who's your favorite band? My favorite band. You, John Roy, putting you on the spot now. That's Who's a, your favorite band of all time? That's a tough one. I mean, I, you know how you go through moods and stuff and like, I don't know, for a while, Eddie Van Halen passed away recently. And so I was listening to a lot of Van Halen. Right now I'm, I'm hooked on Black Sabbath for some reason, like old Black Sabbath, you know? So on tour with Unsteady in the 90s, uh, we were playing ska music every day and playing ska showcases with five bands in every city and every state across the U.S. And we played it so much, we stopped listening to it. Uh -huh. It was like, oh, my God, we're going to have to hear this five hours a day. <laughs> so when we're driving for eight hours to get to the next place, we actually, since this is actually related to what you said, we were listening to old Black Sabbath albums and Sly and Robbie albums back and forth. That's crazy. What the, that's yeah. like, what the yin and yang? Yeah, it's great. <laughs> you know, we didn't create a new genre with it. I was really surprised that never happened, but it really uh, was a palate cleanser after five hours of third wave sky in the 90s. So not only is John Roy running his own business, John Roy Sound and, 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 doing all that stuff that is affiliated with running your own business, but you're also playing in a band. You mentioned Unsteady. That was 27 years ago or whatever that that started. 28. 28 years ago. And Unsteady's still rocking hard, man. Like, well, you will be. Yeah, I mean, everybody's on hiatus right now, right? I mean, there's not a lot going with, with, with music right now. I'm still creating the music, so hopefully, uh... You know, there'll be a live component to it at some point soon. Yeah. Um, fond memories of Unsteady. What well, maybe if you can come up with a top three list of your most favorite memories of the band Unsteady, which you are the lead singer of, you're the saxophone player for, you write a ton of the music, uh, arranging, uh, put you know, booking the show. I mean, you're you're like a, a Superman guy. Yeah, I, I need to have four more sets of hands, three more heads, and 17 sets of legs to get things done. Agreed. Gosh, you know what's terrible? Is that usually you can only remember the things that are the worst things that happen to you. It yeah, but... revolves around, remember that time when we had to get that organ up two flights of stairs? Uh -huh. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I want to hear about. One person could be on the bottom and one on the top. Remember <laughs> fingers again on that thing? Oh my God. Okay, th this one's funny because I just, I keep remembering it and I'm sure that everyone that was there can remember it. Yeah. Um, but 
we played a show um, in Kansas City, outside of Kansas City, at a place called the Gas Station, which is probably no longer there. Okay. And it was it was a very a Blues Brothers moment, where we show up and we're like, all right, we're gonna play this place. It sounds pretty cool. It's called the Gas Station. Sounds fun. Um, hopefully they got a PA that'll sound good. Well, let's go. Let's check it out. And we show up, and it's a closed gas station. Um, they turned it into a bar, <laughs> but it still had like the the bar part was in the service station. Uh huh. Right, so the old gas pumps were still out front. Yeah, and they really—it wasn't like a, a a kitschy kind of thing, you know. Like, hey, this is kind of like the Hard Rock, you know, cafe where all these gas. No, no, this was just an old gas station. Right, right. <laughs> it know? wasn't. It wasn't fixed up or anything like that. It was like they literally rolled the cars out and put yeah. in the bands. Yeah. So they they built the stage with plywood, and um. And people were just definitely just not interested in what we were doing. Okay. <laughs> and, and and how we were playing and the stuff that we were like. I don't think anybody had heard Scott at that point uh -huh. in, in that in that bar ever. And uh, I, I'm definitely sure that not like a seven piece band had showed up to play in a bar like that. It was probably a three piece blues or, you know, rock band. Gotcha. And um, I just remember. There was one guy who was extremely drunk and he was just screaming at us the whole time, but not negatively, like, you know, he was cheering us on in his own mind. And I was more entertained by him, I'm sure, than anybody else was entertained by us. <laughs> and he, he said a lot of things that I, I can't repeat to you here. Right. Because pretty much every other word out of his mouth was a four letter word, but. Gotcha. But uh, yeah, it was fantastic. I'm like, where is this guy from? Inquiring minds want to know, did you pay him after the show? <laughs> uh, no, we, we actually gave him a few of the, the beers that we had, though. Uh -huh. Because he was down for that. Interesting. He definitely told us some stories. He told us about, you know, like different counts of assault with a deadly weapon. Oh, boy. Yeah. That he'd hopefully, had hopefully these were all fake stories. I'm not sure. I, you know what? He was sort of like a, he just reminded me of a, like a character in Cheech and Chong. It just blew my mind. Well, kids, you know? just another reminder, don't talk to strangers. <laughs> <laughs> he was talking about, he had a, a race, race motor 454 engine out of a speedboat that he put into a Trans Am. And he'd, he'd gone over some jumps with it and like, smashed into a car and that was his first count of assault with a deadly weapon yeah this guy sounds like a, a, a real strange dude it's a great story so what are you doing now with music i i think there's some things that uh, you've been working on kind of behind the scenes and are now starting to come out into the the covid world uh, tell us about a little bit about what you got going on there so i've, I've long been a, a live sound engineer um like for, for a business, you know, I've been doing it for 18 years. Mm -hmm. um, that's one part of it. Live sound is one thing. Um, but mixing live sound is different than mixing in a recording studio or mixing remotely. So usually I would work on the live stuff and leave it to someone else that owns their own studio to, to engineer stuff for myself or for the band. Uh, it just sort of makes more sense or, you know, it's just easier to have somebody that already knows their own gear and has worked on their own gear. It's like if someone shows up to play a street fair and I've already set up everything, all they need to do is get on the stage with their instruments and play. Right. Same thing with a studio. It's sort of like when we go into a studio, we expect to pay money and we expect somebody to have all of it together and ready for us to do our thing. Um, well, that's not happening. <laughs> but, <laughs> first off, there's, there's no money for it. Um, and then second off, we can't really have like 10 people 
in a room, even mask. I mean, because especially if you're going to be in a room for 10, 12 hours at a time working right. on recording, the rotation of people, yeah. it, it would, it's just not, not feasible. Not safe. Yeah. Um, so I've had a few people uh, like come over to my shop and I have the right where I'm sitting. I have my interface, just a little stereo interface and a, a few good microphones and some XLR cable and some headphones and some extensions for headphones. So I'm able to put a, a microphone outside of this room and let people play in the warehouse or out on the dock. Okay. So you know, they're, they're between 15 and 30 feet away from me. Right. And uh, so I can record them here. But also if people have their own interfaces, I mean, I've taken, I've taken sound that people have sent me and it's on an album now that one guy was on the side of the freeway and I'm like, hey man, I'm mixing this song down. Uh, you're supposed to give me a vocal track. Yeah. And you haven't. <laughs> I need a vocal track. And as long as you can sing in tune along with any, you know, like in your headphones, I'll take whatever you got. Yeah. He used uh, Facebook Messenger and gave me snippets, like, you know, one line at a time. Wow. With, uh, with his phone pulled over on the side of the freeway. Uh huh. And I took a direct box out of my phone with his in instant messenger messages. Yeah. And put that into the interface and then lined up each of the samples. So, you know, he's actually on an album now. And that was the day we were mixing it down. So, what is this album that you speak of? Oh, so th this one's for uh, something called the, the New Normal Co Collaboration. Okay. Um, drummer uh, Alan Tabool in he's in Pennsylvania and me and Barry Logan San Diego um, we were just talking to each other because we've been you know cooped up for two to three months already I think it was May when we started talking again uh, we I mean we'd always been texting back and forth and talking on Facebook and liking each other's posts that's one thing but another is when you like have a phone conversation and start having a very in-depth conversation like we're both depressed we need to make something happen this is the time to try and make your mark on on the world or do do something and and the stories of people all around me and the stories of people in my band they're pretty much match this his stories and they match the stories of you know 30 plus people that we both know and those people also have recording interfaces or they have phones or they have a laptop or they have an ipad and whichever way they could make music we'd ask people to to play songs so i sequenced uh entire songs with all the parts uh in midi with just i have right next to me a two octave keyboard a little midi keyboard so i sequenced uh, beats, I sequence bass lines, keys, uh, tracked saxophones, uh, tracked vocals like scratch tracks. Um, basically made an entire song and I did that, you know, for this album 10 times. Yeah. And sent that entire track to each person. Um, depending on what they wanted, I would send that whole MIDI song either with their part or with only their part or without their part so for instance uh for brent ford i'll send him a track with bass i'll send him a track without bass that he can track his bass and then i can even send him the solo track of just the bass part so i did that for each person with whatever mixes they wanted to do that's a then, lot of work Ton yeah, of work. They, but then they track themselves so sort of a self-service mm -hmm. checkout <laughs> yep. and then send me whatever they have and since we're not playing live together and we haven't all rehearsed with each other and a couple of the people honestly i had never met i didn't even know their names uh -huh. um because they were friends of alan's on the east coast and he, there's people he'd never met and still has never met on the west coast yep. really pretty cool you know just getting stuff out of the blue that you're like, I don't know is, you know, who's, yeah. who's this trombone player? Oh, well, it's pretty fantastic. Awesome. Let's go with that. 
That's exciting. Yeah. Um, but when people don't normally rehearse or play with each other, they 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 don't necessarily lock in. They're not synced up. They're not super tight with each other. Uh-huh. And if they're first, they're learning a song within a day and then sending me a track. So it needs hours and hours and hours of editing. And I'm sure that your students know a little something already about hours and hours and hours of editing. That's the one thing that you just said that'll be the the highlight of this interview, John, because uh, my students, uh, and I don't know if they're vibing off me or what it is, but they just want to jump into the studio, edit something real quick, and get done with it. And I and I keep telling these guys, that's not how it works, man. No, the yeah. editing part, whether it be video editing or audio editing, it takes a long, long time to get it right. Hours and hours and hours. Yeah, my, my niece like did a few claymation videos. Think about stop motion and the sure. amount of editing that takes. Yeah. You know, move a piece like Robot Chicken. <laughs> I mean, those guys have a crew of people making sets and a crew of people with a camera and a crew of people doing different positions. Sure. So like to do, to do stuff like that. I mean, it's, it's tedious work and you really have to be into it or see the vision of what it's going to be. Yeah. When I made all the, the MIDI tracks for the songs, I knew that that wasn't the end product. It was just a nice template for the people to, to go with. Right. And sometimes I got surprised if people did something different. I'm like, Oh, let's go with that. I'm going to change, I'm going to change and edit this whole thing to match that. Like, let's say the, um, the drummer came up with a different ending or didn't play the ending that I'd put in. Uh Then either A, I edit him to match the ending or B, I edit, I edit him and I edit the bass player to match what happens with the drums at the end. Gotcha. And, And anybody else, I keep sending tracks to the next people in the line. And it continues to evolve until eventually it does sound like a whole band ended perfectly together. Yeah. That was a nice tangent. (laughs) You said the the thing about the editing and takes hours and hours. I think that's going to be a main focal point of what I talk to the students about when we watch this interview together. Garbage, garbage in, garbage out. You know, that's one of the, there's a lot of little, little catchphrases that we, we use in production and, also in sales and rental and yeah. live production. And, you know, these things tend to hold true, like buy nice or buy twice. You yeah. know, like if you, if you go the cheap route, the same thing applies. Right. If you go the cheap route and buy the cheap product or you, yeah, I could just get by just doing a little bit and this will be fine. Right. Why does this not look like it should be, you know, on like a video? Why does this not look like it should be in a cinema? Why does this not look super pro like the people that I buy albums from? Right. So the thing that you do, does it look like something that someone should buy? Uh-huh. Because that's how it is in the end. I, I go with your artistic vision as well. But if it's not well produced, well edited, and like slick enough, then it's not going to necessarily fly. People's attention spans, young to old, are not very long. Yep. So you got to make it pop. It's got to like you got to do a bunch of work to make it pop within the first 20, 30 seconds. Right. So I I love all that stuff and and I was going to kind of try to wrap things up with you by asking, what are some tips that you would suggest for these students that are in high school right now? you know, and and say, I want to be a YouTuber. I want to be a, a live studio uh, engineer. I want to be a musician. I want to be a, you know, whatever it is they want to do in this arts, media, and entertainment industry. Do you have any advice for these guys on, uh, and and the, the advice that you were just talking about may be the, the, the best advice I've ever heard, you know, which is, is make sure that you put out a product that people are going to want to buy, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then it looks professional. But do you have do you have any other words of wisdom before we wrap things up here? Well, I'd say, you know, think of it like think of it like uh, I say like pro baseball, pro basketball, pro football, right? It, it's it's very similar for people making beats. 
man, there are so many good basketball, so many good baseball players, you know, like, Hey, I, I played little league. I did a few years and I felt like I was getting pretty good. And then the next level came after that. And the next level came after that out of, you know, let's just say there's a million people, a thousand people make it to triple a ball. Right. And then like, 10 people make it to pro ball. So you have to consider, see, think of the same thing. You make beats. You want to make beats. I will tell you almost everyone who is, who I've talked to, who rents stuff for me, they all say, yeah, man, I, I make beats. Well, that means that everybody, everybody's making beats, man. There's, you know, you think yourself, you think everyone in your class. Now, take this times 5,000. So that beat has got to be the beat to beat all beats. <laughs> you know, like that. I mean, it's cool to have faith in yourself that you're, you're doing a great job. But listen to things around you. Try to be the original person. Do the thing with, you know, do all the work. Do all that tedious work. But, you know make something different and original uh, otherwise you'll be someone else that's that's making beats in your garage yeah and let me tell you there's a lot of them i think it was this, exactly the same thing for music some of the best guitar players i've ever heard have never left their garage <laughs> now, now you can not leave your garage and you can record you know a live stream but i'm saying like they never went out they never gigged right you know, they just got better and better at their instrument, but they they didn't put themselves out there and yeah. the music that they create, nobody really wanted to hear. If you make something and nobody wants to hear it, you're the tree falling in the forest. <laughs> no, one, you know, no one's going to hear it. Did it even really ever happen? <laughs> yeah, to, to become a YouTube star, people have whole networks of other people behind them. And that's cool because you know what? You could probably be someone within that network or you could be the person who's heading that network of people creating the next YouTube star. Yeah. Or whatever the next platform will be because YouTube is an, a new platform, but it's getting old. So there's going to be another and another and another and another. But I'm, sure, I, I'm sure you're already on to Twitch, right? Yeah, actually. Um, I just the, downloaded my first Twitch account. Twitch page up. Yeah. And again, I'm, I'm a dinosaur, man. Like I, me too, but it was sort of like, well, we, we play like ska, reggae and rock steady music with that collaboration, but, but okay. Gamers are on this all the time. Well, Hey man, people into people into what we're doing are, are into gaming as well. So let's try and reach out to them. You know, we're on Twitter and Instagram. Hopefully we're on Pinterest too. That'd be fun. Um, how, about, how about Snapchat? Are you into that yet? Um, that, that's a done deal already, isn't it? Isn't Snapchat just about over? Yeah, it probably is on its way out. I'm, I don't know. All, all the younger kids use that. Yeah, I, I, I'm good with all platforms. Um, <laughs> you know, I, the, the other part is that you could be on social media all day and then not get anything done. Sure. So we've gotten to a point where Alan's great at logistics. I'm great at editing, mm -hmm. I'm great at creating music. And Alan's, you know, got some people on the East coast that like, now there's a team. So there's someone who's a, a web designer, right. there's somebody who's just dealing with our social media in general. There's somebody who's strictly a dedicated video editor. Yeah. And then he has an intern working with him too. So, mm -hmm you know, we're, we're editing videos of things. And since we all have to do it remotely, individuals have to submit their own performances. You've seen everybody's um, like acapella uh -huh. kind of things. Sure. Um, so we're doing something like that a little bit more on steroids. Okay. But by the same token, we can't get together and play. And some people are, are too busy doing their, their remote work, like Mr. Brent Ford here. <laughs> Um, so if they can't make their videos of them performing, man, that gets a little boring too, after a minute, Yeah. like, okay, well, I get to see a split screen with like 
nine people. Right. Well, that's great. Whatever. Yeah. So now we're starting to come up with more conceptual stuff. So getting into animation, um, doing that, that animation, anything from, you know, I'm working on a puppet show. Uh -huh. Literally, like, can I get a headshot from each person in the band? Right. And get a side view, head, like, shot of each person in an action shot playing music from, like, last year when we could have concerts. Yeah. Send all those and to my sister and my niece. She's a seamstress. Uh-huh. And she's going to make hand puppets. So we're, and my, you know, my niece is a, a an aspiring director. So she's going to like direct these hand puppets to make a video of the song that we recorded. That's the most awesome and, thing ever. I, I, I can't wait to see you that. Know, that's getting within my family network too. You know, you got your musician family, you got your musical family, you got your regular family. I've seen um, video submissions, for instance, uh, Mr. Ford from his class, from the AME class. And it was really fun to see when a student would like enlist their brother and sister and their cousin and their best friend uh -huh. and their mom and their aunt to help them make a video. And that's kind of what it takes. Right. You're just trying to get off the ground and do your thing. And especially now, if you're, you know, you have to do everything remotely. Yeah. Hey, get good at convincing your, your family members to help you out on stuff and do stuff remotely. So true. So true, man. Well, hey, John, I'm, um, we're just about out of time here. And I, I wanted to thank you so much for always supporting the El Cajon Valley High School AME pathway. Um, you've been a longtime supporter, not only as a guest speaker, but also as an advisor to uh, the school district. And um, we can't thank you enough for that. And I hope that that um, somehow, some way, we can repay you someday uh, by getting you a bunch of business, or I don't know how it how it works. But um, everybody in your classroom in person again. Yeah, I just, I just, I just really appreciate you taking time out for the kids and 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 for me too. You know, makes it I, I do believe in karma, so you know do the right thing, do the thing that you feel is, is morally just and correct. Don't do the super selfish thing. Because honestly, if you want to be selfish in the end, it's going to come back to you positively or not. Yeah. So just try and, you know, try and let your moral compass guide you through this. I, I agree a hundred percent, man. If you can work as hard as you can. I look forward to uh, when we're all back to quote unquote normal that um, the unsteady ska band is performing at the live at lunch concert in person, not virtually, which you guys did uh, last year, which was super awesome. And uh, again, thank you so much for everything that you're that you're doing. Heck yeah, I'm going to keep sending songs to this guy too. I appreciate it. I'll keep recording bass lines. Dude, yeah. we'll talk to you soon. Okay, thank you again. And, uh, and thanks for being there for the kids. You bet. Thank you. All right. Take care, John.